use wood like ash and pine that would otherwise be susceptible to rot. We're pasting this mayonnaise-like material over the wood, as you saw early on, and in a period of about two weeks, it soaks right through the wood, preserving it all. We applied it generously over the Kittlesons. Over the 10 years that we had the boat, we never had any rot anywhere. To preserve the planks for the center deck, we used the same preservative in this liquid form. We made a bath and soaked the planks by leaving them for half an hour. Until we reckoned the wood would be penetrated sufficiently to protect it forever. Then we put them to drain and dry. Meanwhile, Aruna is fastening down tea mats over the cabin roof. The matting looks beautiful and creates a porous layer to avoid condensation. We fit a layer of insulation between the ribs and over all a layer of tin foil to make a curved radar reflector. The final coat is canvas painted with chlorinated rubber paint. This forge I made for shoeing horses while in London. It's powered with a 12 volt battery and a blower from a Morris 1000. These are the steel straps from which I will make the brackets for the center deck beams. Each strap needs several large holes and it's much easier for us to punch them in the red hot steel than to drill them. These are the final shapes, and this is how we get the shape using this wonderful old device.
the final step is to put the almost red-hot metal into a bucket of tar. The tar burns onto the hot strap, leaving a carbon layer that protects it from rust. It is commonly called Chinese galvanizing, and I can tell you it is very effective. There never was any rust on the straps, even though they were constantly in contact with salt water. The big day has come, and the beautiful long truck of the Wheeler brothers comes slowly down the road to the farm. The Wheeler family have a transport company and offer to move Talua for the nominal cost of £20. This is Alan Wheeler, the driver, and this is his elder brother, John, the chief of the company. The space in the farmyard is too small to turn the truck, but Mr. Wheeler has a strategy for this. With the help of the 40 volunteers who have arrived to move the house, unbelievably, we were able to bounce the truck across the farmyard. Forty men and their families have arrived, many from the Nailsworth Voluntary Fire Brigade. Exactly the number we need. We made ten carrying frames to fit under each hull, with two men on each side of each frame. We calculated that each man would not have to carry more than 50 pounds weight. I explained to everyone the marks on the boat at the position of each frame to coincide with the shape of the hull. It's the critical moment to lift and to everyone's great relief we are quite easily able to lift the boat. We make our way along the path we decided to go over the wall because otherwise we would have to go down the big hill and up the other side. To get to the farmyard, I've removed the top of the wall to make it a bit easier to climb over. Everyone is very patient. The stalwart volunteers carry the hulls all along the narrow path on the top of the ridge to the farmyard. In case we need rest, two people are carrying big blocks of wood to put the hull down so as not to get the carrying frames trapped underneath. To get into the farmyard, we have to pass through a gate. I cut the carrying frames just four inches shorter than the width of the gate, so that we should be able to just pass through. The next difficult movement is to transfer the hull onto the low loader. Mr. Wheeler 
does a wonderful job of organizing everybody. There's such good communication between everybody involved and how to make this happen. Nobody gets hurt and the whole maneuver is successful. I've planned a way to hold the hull upright while we go for the next one. The great gamble is whether everyone will come back to carry the second hull. This is Mr. Gifford, a man that specializes in making sailing fishing boats for third world countries. To my great relief, people weren't exhausted from carrying the first hull. And everybody's stamina is so good that we don't need to stop to rest, not even for the second hull. The wheelers have brought a smaller truck to load the turtle's head camp, the motor and everything else. Here is the yard arm of the tuna rig sail. And here come the tuna buttons themselves. These are the buttons for our sail. Next comes the delicate task of tying everything down securely. Finally, all is safely loaded and the truck slowly makes its way along the farm road, avoiding the trees. Mr. Wheeler walks behind, encouraging the truck driver on. The most difficult part is over, and now we drive speedily through Stroud, on the way to the riverbank, a distance of about 20 miles. At the riverbank, the Mill family of Cobbys Rock have very kindly given us permission to unload the boat and to make the final preparations for launching. This haystack was in the way. Many hands make light work. In a few seconds, the whole stack is moved.
This is Mrs. Wheeler. Well practiced with ropes. We unload the hull onto the riverbank. These flood banks were built to protect the land from flooding at high water. They are about two meters high. Very carefully, we passed a boat over the bank. Then we have to turn the hulls around to have the bow facing towards the river. For the first time, Talo will see the River Seven. We try a new trick for the second hull, resting it on the block of wood on top of the flood wall and spinning it around. Finally, we are able to position and attach two hulls via the cross beams. Eventually, we step the mast and begin to rig the boat. At spring tides, the River Seven has a remarkable phenomenon called the Seven Ball. It is caused by the tide funneling into the Bristol Channel and making what would normally be a small river turn into a roaring tidal race going upstream. <laughs>